Lakeland PBS, the Bemidji Pioneer, Brainerd Dispatch, Park Rapids Enterprise, and Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2022, a look at our area legislative candidates. Your moderator tonight is Ray Gildow. And now, the House District 5B debate. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our second debate this evening with, uh, I gotta get my notes here, Mr. Henderson and Mr. Weiner, and I'm gonna call them both by their first names as soon as I get organized. This is our second debate this evening and our final debate, and there will be one more debate tomorrow at eight o'clock. And our candidates tonight are Greg Hendrickson, who is an independent alliance candidate, and Mike Weiner, who is a Republican candidate. And uh, our panelists are Dennis Wyman, to my immediate right, who is the news director for Lakeland Public TV, Heidi Holton, national public radio affiliate, KAXE news director, and Chelsea Perkins, Brainerd's recent listed as the best writer in the Brainerd Lakes area from the Brainerd Dispatch. So welcome again, panelists. Nice to have you here. Real quick review of the, of the rules. Uh, each candidate will get three minutes to make an opening comment. Panelists will question after opening comments, and some of the questions will be their own, and some might be coming from the public. The candidates will rotate in the order that they begin speaking with opening comments and finishing with closing comments. Each candidate gets two minutes to answer the question. Each candidate will have a one-minute rebuttal opportunity. Candidates will have the option of using a one-minute bonus time to add on to one of their answers this evening if they so choose. This can be done during the answer to the initial question or during a rebuttal, but it can only be done one time. Questions will continue until we are about 50 minutes into the debate when we move to closing comments. And the closing com comments for each candidate will be two minutes. Um, I guess this is something we don't need to do. So the first uh, question will be coming this evening uh, from Dennis from Lakeland, and he will be addressing that to um, Mr. Hendrickson. First, we'll go to opening comments for each other. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it showed not pick up my papers. Sure. Yes. So that would be who? Opening comments, we'll go with Mr. Hendrickson. Start with three minutes. Hi, my name is Greg Hendrickson, and I'm the endorsed candidate for the Independence Alliance Party. Um, I uh, live south of Long Prairie, have three children, and uh, I have two, great grand, two grandchildren that live in, in District 5B. I've got a business degree and, and 40 years experience in management finance and sales and marketing. Um, I've been in District 5B for around 40 years. I know the, the place well. And, and the reason I'm running for office is because of the two-party system I feel is broken. And as a swing voter down in St. Paul, I feel I will be getting something done for uh, our, my district, which is District 5B. And I'm not going to vote party lines, obviously. I will be voting only for the people in 5B. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lakeland Broadcasting, for putting this on this evening. Um, it's a great opportunity for the voters to get the chance to see the differences in, in, in our platforms and who we are. So first, I'd like to give a little bit of history for those of you who don't know me, and then why I got into politics. I grew up south of Long Prairie on a farm. My mom was a full-time nurse. Dad farmed, owned a business, a construction business. Grew up uh, baling hay, pecking rocks. Ended up working with dad for a number of years through high school. Um, a lot of egg, grain bins, steel buildings, concrete, cement work. Pretty typical for our area. Uh, I moved away, went to college in St. Cloud went for a business management and sales with the intention of always owning my own business. I met my wife, Amber, in St. Cloud, and uh, we have nine kids together. We've been married 21 years. We decided to move back home after our first child was born, um, really for the, the environment. You know, Long Prairie and Todd County, rural Minnesota is a great place to raise a family and actually to start a business as well. So why I got involved in politics is, is really the challenges that I saw. Owning my own business, I, I constantly see overtaxation, overregulation. We're driving businesses out of Minnesota. We're driving people out of Minnesota. We lost about 20,000 people last year 
due to high taxes and people going to low tax states. We've seen the effects of defund and reform the police and how that demoralizes and villainizes our police, our local sheriff. Makes their job a lot harder. We've seen how the Second Amendment is constantly attacked, how red flag laws, common sense gun reform was really backdoor ways to attack our Second Amendment rights. I've seen how financial, fiscal policies rather, have really caused the inflation issues that we're seeing and how energy policies are driving our fuel and our energy prices through the roof. So I got involved because I see these issues and words from my dad came back to me and said, you can't complain too much if you don't get involved. So I decided to get involved. I wanna bring back common sense to our politics. I wanna be of, by, and for the people the way it was t intended. And I wanna go down there and represent the people of 5B, not just my kids and their future, but for all of our kids and all of our future. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Greg? We do the first question? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll go to the first question and it will be addressed to you, Mike, to start with, and it'll be coming from Dennis. All right, thanks, Ray, and thank you both for joining us tonight. Uh, as mentioned, I think it's a great service for viewers to hear from both of you on your views on several topics. And the topic I'm going to talk about is crime in the state. Bureau of Criminal Apprehension releases yearly statistics on crime statewide. And overall, from 2018 to 2021, violent crime is up 42%, uh, murders are up 93%, and robberies are up 35%. As a lawmaker, how would you work to reverse this increase in crime in the state? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we've seen how the defund and reform the police policies have really attacked the police departments, our local sheriffs and so forth. The demoralization and the attacks have affected not just the cities where this has really run rampant, but also in greater Minnesota as well. Our sheriff's candidates have said that we have a really hard time maintaining the police that we have and then recruiting new police as well. So we need to financially support the police. We need to let them know that, uh, you know, the defund and reform the police platform that's being promoted is, is not what we're, pro, what we're for. We're pro-police and pro-security. Uh, and we need that for our good neighborhoods and good communities. Thank you, Mike. Greg? Yes, um, there's, there's two systems in this state. One is happening in the cities as far as the crime goes, and then there's the outstate in, you know, in uh, District 5B. We don't have the crime out here they do have in the cities. Um, our law enforcement, our local police departments and, and sheriff's departments in, in District 5B are doing a tremendous job, and everybody in District 5B does support them. Um, they are not being de defunded they're de uh, for uh, not being able to recruit uh, candidates. It's, it's, because of, it's, it's because of their wages. They're competing with uh, other local governments and stuff like that to uh, recruit them. There isn't enough police officers in the state. Um, but we should always be funneling money to our police departments. They do keep us safe. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. The next question is coming from uh, Heidi. Uh, you're both running to be the next legislator from District 5B. Do you trust the Minnesota election system? I believe it's me. Yes. Um, I do believe the election system in Minnesota is pretty safe. Um, that being said, I, I do say that we should constantly, um, you know, fund more into our election security just in case, you know, to help prevent a breach of our security. Um, it's better to uh, um, prevent a breach than to look at it afterwards and say, yeah, we were breached. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Any additional comments, Mike? Well, I, you have another I get minute. to answer, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <you're> first. <laughs> sure. When it comes to election, it's something that's been contested for some time. I believe Hillary Clinton contested the outcome of the election in 2016. Um, other candidates on both sides have questioned the results of elections. When, as a student of history, I, and I really do enjoy looking at it, we've seen that since the beginning of time, elections have been frauded. Um, 
Lyndon Johnson's book, he said there was a statement in there that he did everything short of sitting on the ballot box. So we know that this has happened for beginning of since the beginning of politics. We really do need to make sure that our, our elections are safe and secure and that every vote is counted and every vote is valid. I do believe in voter ID. I believe it's actually absolutely imperative that you know the people who are casting votes um, are who they say they are. The chances of fraud, I think, in greater Minnesota are, are pretty small, but it's something that we constantly need to keep an eye on, and we need to make sure that these elections are, fa are, are safe and secure. Thank you. Any additional, Craig? Yes. Um, um, back in 2012, voter ID was actually on the Minnesota ballot, and it failed. The reason it failed back then was because it was uh, disassociating veterans and, and, social, and, and senior citizens from uh, voting because they didn't have the proper ID. As a veteran, I am, I am a veteran also, a United States Army veteran, um, I, I see how that could have been ha happening with the military ID cards that were in place. Um, I'm not against voter ID cards. Our voter ID, but if if we have the if we solve the problems of disassociating people from our elections, I'm all for it. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Any additional comments, Mike? Sure. <clears throat> Forty-six out of forty-seven countries in Europe require voter ID. They went through the same issues that we saw in the past. They also have really strict mail-in or absentee ballot rules. So we need to follow those examples. Voter ID may have, pa may have not passed in the past, but we definitely see a need for it, and we need to make sure that our elections are safe. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Chelsea, and it will be directed to you first, Mike. Affordable housing plays a critical role in allowing rural communities to grow and develop a sustainable workforce. In what ways would you seek to encourage more affordable housing in the communities that you would represent? Thank you. <clears throat> We've seen uh, housing issues across greater Minnesota for some time. Regulation is definitely an issue when it comes to large, low-income housing. The cost of building those and the regulation that goes with it really prices it out of comparison when you compare it to the private sector. So we need to look at how we're doing affordable housing, how we can manage it better. Um, the other thing that we really need to take into, or look ahead in the future here, is our aging population. We have roughly 30% of our population in greater Minnesota is elderly. This is that baby boomer generation. You know, and when we look ahead here, property and houses that they own right now could be vac vacant in the next 10 years. So we need to plan, we need to look ahead at what's coming down the road. Those, those numbers could change significantly as the baby boomers um, move on in life. Thank you, Mike. Great. <clears throat> well, I, was, I agree with Mike. Housing is a problem in, in District 5B. Um, we've, got, we've got a lot of workers there that are, are uh, you know, they're just being crammed into the existing houses that are, are in the area. Um, the people that want to come to the area, you, they have to drive along if they want to work in the area, they have to drive a, drive a long way to get to work. The commuting distance is hard. We need a lot more housing. Um, the only way to attract young families and more businesses is to have housing for their workers and have families that need to come in and they have to have a place to stay. We definitely, we definitely need it, um, and uh, the legislature should be front and center on this in these rural areas and trying to get these housing projects going. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any additional comments there, Mike? I guess the only other thing that I would mention is, is taxes. You know, if we give, or if, if workers had more of their money, if they were allowed to have, keep more of their money, housing wouldn't be as much of an issue. If you, we eliminate some of the social security tax, income tax, property tax, we can make that housing more affordable, affordable for workers as well. Thank you. A any additional uh, comments from you, Greg? No. None there? Okay. Our next question will be coming from Dennis, and it will be directed to you, Greg. Actually, I think Heidi's up this time for us. Did I skip you? Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> okay. Um, 
The overturning of Roe v. Wade by the Supreme Court has left abortion law to the states. Doe v. Gomez in Minnesota ruled that the Minnesota Constitution protects a woman's right to have an abortion. What do you think the role of government is when it comes to women's reproductive health? I believe the government should stay out. I believe the uh, um, woman's health should be in her hands, uh, her doctor's hands, and, and her faith. Thank you. Thank you. As a father of nine, I am 100% pro-life. I believe that life begins at conception and goes to a natural death. Um, we've actually seen the negative impacts of, of the birth rate. We have a negative birth rate in our country. So we're not having enough kids to, to build up in the future. Some of the issues that we're seeing as far as not having enough workers are directly impacted by our negative birth rate. The other thing about uh, abortion rights and so forth is we're not supporting the women enough. You know, when we have unwed mothers, we're, we're telling them the only option for them is to abort their baby. And there is millions of people that would love to be able to abort those children. I mean, I'm sorry, adopt those children. So we need to be able to support those women better, and we're not doing that right now. Thank you. Any additional comments? Yes, um, you know, getting back to the adoption, adoption is a good way to, uh, um, you know, is a good is good for you know for everybody in, in Minnesota, but the fact remains that there is currently in our adoption system there's 6,800 uh, children waiting to get adopted right now in our in our in our system right now. Um, to adopt a person, um, it costs seventy five thousand dollars to adopt somebody in the in the state of Minnesota right now. To adopt somebody out of a hospital, it's excessive of $100,000. There isn't a lot of people in 5B that can afford the adoptions. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, any additional comment, Mike? So I guess the argument then would be it's easier and cheaper to abort them to keep them alive. That, that's a dangerous situation, and I do believe that sanctity of life goes a long ways. Once we start treating the unborn as just a clump of cells and it has no meaning, then we end up with you know, a, a society that doesn't value life, and that's a dangerous society. Thank you, Mike. Any, anything additional? No, I'm um, good. Sir Greg? Okay. <clears throat> Our next question is coming from Dennis. Thanks, Ray. Be to okay, got it. Are there <laughs> any changes to the way we fund education in Minnesota or our education system in general that you would advocate for? Uh, me? Yes, Greg. Uh -huh. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, we, we do need fully fund our school districts. I have a, I have a friend that's a uh, teacher, and before the start of the school year, she was spending, she was just running around shopping and, and buying the stuff that she needed for her classroom. And I says, what, do they give you a per diem or something for that, or some sort of a, a, a voucher so you can go out and spend this and get reimbursed? She said, no, this comes out of our pockets and we have to supply our own children with school supplies. Um, obviously, we're not paying them enough to do that, um, and we need to fund our schools better and get them back on, on track. I do realize that our kids have fallen back, um, and we need to catch them up, and we're not going to catch them up by abandoning the uh, um, funding of the schools. Thank you. Any additional comments there, Mike? Well, I think I get two minutes to answer, so oh. I'll take care of that oh, first. Yeah. Um, I've had the unique opportunity of seeing education in three different, three different ways. I went to private school to begin with, public school, homeschooled for a little bit, and then went back to public school. So I see the advantages of different types of education and how that can affect the different kids. The voucher system, I think, is something that could really help out our education. Everybody wants the best education for their kids, but every kid is different. You know, with nine kids myself, I see that one option for one kid may not work for the other one. And where a homeschool setup may work for some, a private school may work for others, and a public school might work for some as well. And I believe that if we give parents the option, to take their tax money, and in Minnesota, I believe it's roughly $11,000 per student, and they decide what's best for their children, where they want them to be educated, and I think that would be a great option and would help out our education system. Thank you, Mike. Any additional comments there, Greg? Yeah, I'm not for a vulture program at all. 
I just think it's just taking away money from the school districts. Thank you. Any follow-up there, Mike? No. Okay. <clears throat> Our next question will be coming from Chelsea, and it will be directed towards Mike. In what ways would you work across the aisle and bridge the partisan divide to accomplish legislation to the benefit of your constituents? I guess communication goes a long ways. Um, you know, I have through the years, especially on the Planning and Zoning Board, seen a variety of different personalities and, and different types of people. Um, I have to say that one dear friend that I had on the board for a number of years was really different personality and, and belief system than what I have. But we understood each other and we could communicate. It wasn't a confrontational thing. We knew that we had opposing views, but at the same time, we could talk and treat each other with respect. I think that goes a long ways. So in politics, we really need to get back to some of that. When we can have a conversation with somebody, and it doesn't matter if they have a D or an R behind their name, we know that we may have a different opinion on how to get things done, but we're trying to shoot for the same goals. And I think that's what we need to bring back, some of that back to politics. Thank you, Mike. Greg? Um, as, a, as an independent, I'm going to be a swing voter down there in St. Paul, so I will be reaching out to both parties, and both parties will be reaching out for me. Um, and I'll be working primarily for the, the District of 5B, and I will be able to get some of stuff accomplished which hasn't been accomplished in that district for 25 years. Um, uh, there's a lot of things that I have on my agenda that I want to solve, and one of them would be property taxes and bringing broadband into the county, and I can achieve that as a swing voter for District 5B. Thank you. Um, Mike, do you have any comments? You know, we really have seen in <coughs> politics the, the vitriol, the bipartisan bickering and so forth, and I think just communication goes a long ways. And if we treat each other with respect, we may have different, different views, different opinions, but at the end of the day, we should be able to shake hands and then move on. Thank you. Any additional comment there, Greg? Nope, I'm good. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Our next question is coming from Heidi, and it will be directed to Greg. Give us an idea of what you think, how clean energy and renewable energy is working in the region. What do you think needs to happen in the future? Well, we are, we are, uh, are slowly but surely uh, getting, getting off fossil fuels. Um, that is happening. Whether we like it or not, it's going to happen. Um, I do feel that um, some of the technology and, and car batteries just aren't here yet for our, our rural areas in the winter months. Um, is it going to get there? Most likely. Um, and the, you know, the infrastructure that they're doing for recharging, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm sure that's coming. Um, if we were to switch the, the, switch the bulb over right now today and, and say everybody gets electric cars, I don't think uh, we're ready for that. Um, I can see how it would be a benefit for the cities. They got smaller commutes, um, they got the charging stations, they got the infrastructure. Out here in rural America, we just don't have that yet. Um, as far as the uh, uh, clean energy goes, I think we should probably look into nuclear energy again as a clean source of energy as we bridge the gap between coal and fossil fuels and the clean energy. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Mike? <clears throat> when it comes to energy, it's, it's an issue that's been dealing with for a while. In the United States here, we don't have the infrastructure to transition to electric and renewables as quickly as they're saying. Right now, they're estimating between four and seven trillion dollars just to build the infrastructure for electric vehicles. Your average house, you know, with a 100 amp breaker system doesn't have enough service to even charge your battery and run the things that you need in your home. We're not there yet. Transition is going to take time. But when we look at fossil fuels as well, we have not invested in our fossil fuels for about 30 years. When we look at other countries such as China and India, China I believe has seven um, refineries that they're planning on building. So if we're looking at global climate change, we really need to look at some of the biggest, biggest polluters in the world. The United States, our carbon emissions haven't changed much since the 1970s. And yet China's has just skyrocketed. 
So are we going to change from fossil fuels to the detriment of our economy and our people? I mean, we've got to look at, take a look at the bigger picture here and really figure out if this is something we can move to that quickly. The other thing we need to look at is, um, as Greg mentioned, nuclear I think is a good option. Um, it's been used in other countries and it's been safe. Hydroelectric, in Minnesota it's not even considered a renewable and it really needs to get taken a look at. We've got miles and miles of, of river that can be utilized for that so we have a consistent and safe renewable energy. Thank you, Mike. Rick, any additional comment there? Well, I do believe we have to do something. The consequences is, you know, the, the result of not doing something is, is worse than uh, some economic burdens on us. So I do believe we have to do that. Um, and, you know, clean energy, we're not going to get away from that. I mean, it's coming. Uh, whether we're ready for it or not, it's going to be coming. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, any additional comments there? You know, we do need to invest more money into renewable resources, but in my business itself, we take waste wood and we recycle and it gets used for animal bedding and it eliminates the use of fertilizer, tons of fertilizer for our farms. So there's options that we need to look at that aren't being used right now that I think would help a lot of different things. The, the use of ammonia and so forth and as fertilizers, which comes from natural gas. I mean, we need to look at all options. It's not just our energy, but how we do a lot of different things. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Dennis. And Mike, you'll be the first one to respond, please. Regardless of which party is in office, how do you feel about the governor of the state holding emergency powers and making decisions without input from the state legislature in times of emergency? Of course, most recently this was applied during the COVID pandemic, but in the future, there could be similar situations that arise. And how do you feel about that, regardless of if it's a Democrat or Republican in office? That's a great question. And it's something that we looked at here and there was a lot of opposition to it. There, there's a five day original window that, uh, that Governor Walls used. And then we had 14 days to flatten the curve and it just kept getting extended. I don't believe either party should use the governorship and become a dictator. It's not good for either one. We have resources that could be utilized, Zoom and so forth. If there's an emergency, we can call the legislators back together and have sessions and communicate within a very short amount of time. But to unilaterally run the state without the legislation, it's unconstitutional and neither party should have used it. Thank you, <clears throat> Greg. Yeah, the, the emergency powers, uh, um, you know, there, there are some instances where you, you want that, you need that to have it in your pocket. Um, you know, did, did Walls extend that too long? He may have. Um, I don't have that answer. Um, I'm certainly glad I wasn't in his shoes when the pandemic hit. Um, and I'm sure, you know, there isn't a, a politician around or anybody running for office that wanted to be in that position when that happened. There was a lot on his table. He didn't know what he didn't know. Um, and, and I'm not defending him, but I'm just saying, I, you know, I, I, emergency powers, there's a point for them, and then there's a point not to have them. And, and I'm not going to judge him on whether or not he extended that too much, but I, I feel that he probably did. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> Any additional comments there, Mike? Sure, emergency power, um, I, I believe it's in the definition or in the words there, it's an, an emergency. We saw that at the beginning of COVID, and do I blame the governor for what he did there? No. We're, we're faced with a situation where there was a lot of unknowns, but to extend it for the time period that they did, that he did, that was wrong. Any additional comments? Greg? No. No? Okay. <clears throat> Move on to the next question. We'll be coming from Chelsea, and it'll be directed to Greg. Many <clears throat> rural Minnesotans in need of mental health care must wait weeks or even months for an appointment with a provider, and there are not enough beds in facilities. In what ways would you support expansion of mental health care infrastructure in the state to meet growing needs? We definitely need more mental health facilities in District 5B. Um, as a veteran, um, the, uh, the suicide rate for veterans right now are, are, are 21 a day. It's, it's appalling, and they need the mental health services also. Our farmers have the highest suicide rate in the area. 
they need the help. We have the, uh, um, the opioid crisis going on. We have the drug problems going on. They need, we need mental health um, counselors in the county, not only in, in the county as a county level, but also in our school systems to help these people out. Um, health health uh, um, safety and, and mental health is, is, is a high priority of mine. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Mike. <clears throat> Well, mental health is an issue that's been coming up in a lot of different areas. Um, we've discussed it rather thoroughly with the sheriff's candidates and how they're dealing with the situations. There's obviously issues in schools. We've had, uh, as Greg mentioned, the veterans. Um, but the resources there in greater Minnesota aren't what we see in the cities. Uh, I was discussing this down at a committee meeting recently where I asked, you know, what does the sheriff and how do they deal with these mental health issues? Well, they have resources, they have facilities and stuff when they have people that come in or they're dealing with where they can take them. And we just don't have that in greater Minnesota. So we do need to look at how we're structuring that, what can be spent, uh, best place to put it, and then deal with our health and human services, local sheriffs and schools, put those resources where they're best, best needed and best suit the people. Greg, any additional comments there? No. Nope. Okay. Anything, any additional comments, Mike? No. Okay. The, more, the next question uh, will be from uh, Heidi, and it will be directed to you, Mike. <clears throat> I want to give you a chance to tell us a little more about the district that you're running in, 5B. Uh, what's the campaign trail been like? What businesses have you seen that have some great potential? What's, what's one of the, some of the biggest industries in that region? Well, 5B is an area that uh, I've known and done business with um, since we started our business. We have a lot of agriculture is still big. We have a lot of wood industry, trucking is big. Um, of course, food processing is also big with the packing plants and, and so forth. So, you know, when you compare the issues of 5B to Greater Minnesota, it's a, it's a lot the same. We have personnel issues with not having enough workers. We have high tax issues. Um, some of the businesses that I see that are, are really unique are the small startup businesses, that people starting a business in their own home or in their garage. Those types of businesses tend to grow. So if we can foster an environment where we support them instead of punish them, which we often see happen if they're in a rural area and uh, all of a sudden uh, we're not zoned or regulated or they're not zoned or regulated correctly, well, it can hamper the growth of those businesses. So that's something that we need to do in our area where we can give the opportunity to those people to, uh, to stay home and stay local and build those businesses for our local economy. Thank you, Mike. Greg. <clears throat> we have a, we have, uh, 5B is a unique uh, district. Uh, we have some great people down there. We're very diverse kind of people. We got, you know, any, in, all kinds of industry down there, but agriculture is by far our biggest um, industry down there. Um, we have a, I, I talked to several farmers here um, not too long ago, and they're kind of excited about the new planting season. Um, after uh, the legislature uh, passed the, the new hemp thing that happened last year, um, they're shovel ready. They want to start uh, manufacturing, uh, putting up manufacturing plants, uh, plant in the ground, and do everything in-house in for, for District 5B. The only thing they're asking for is guidance. That was kind of thrown together in a, in, in a, in a kind of a weird way without um, any kind of guidance out of the legislature, and they're kicking it to the counties, and, and it's just the wrong place for the county to be at. They got their own hands full on dealing with property taxes and everything else they got going on. And I just thought that was pretty careless of the legislatures in the session that did that. So hopefully uh, right away that, that will be solved because it's uh, six months away before planting season starts. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Any additional comments there, Mike? No, it's just been great getting to know more of the people in our area from Wadena all the way south, Cass County, over into Morrison County. You know, we've got, in greater Minnesota, we've got the, just the down to earth great people. And uh, I love living there. I've enjoyed getting to know more and more people. Look forward to representing the area. Any additional comments there, Greg? Nope. 
Okay. We'll move on to the next question. will be coming from Dennis, and it will be directed to Greg. Are there any <clears throat> changes to the state's tax system that you would advocate for? Absolutely. Um, I'm all for property tax reform. Uh, we, are, we, as Mike mentioned earlier, we're an aging population, and, and, and our government keeps growing, and that puts more of a burden on their existing taxpayers in, in 5B. We have to change that tax code for there's nine counties that are being affected the same way do we do. I, I propose us changing the tax code for these rural areas um, and, and uh, set a state levy for those and then do a, a payment in kind from the state to offset those taxes. We are starting to tax our senior citizens out of our houses. It's unsustainable. The Wadena County is, is wrestling with a million dollar uh, uh, tax levy over last year. It's just unsustainable. Um, they can't tackle this themselves. They need the help from the legislatures. And I'm gonna get that done and did for District 5B. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Mike? Taxes is a big issue and it's one of the reasons that uh, probably inspired me to get involved more into politics. Um, over taxation on our businesses, taxation on property taxes, which Greg mentioned, the social security tax. You know, we're taxing seniors on, on social security that they already paid taxes on. Other states have cut their income taxes. You know, and when we're seeing record inflation across the nation, one of the things that we can do is cut taxes to put more money back into those people's pockets. You know, when it comes to property taxes, California does something that, that I really like, and it makes sense. They have a 2% rule. So basically what happens is your property tax can only go up 2% per year. So what it does is it protects those elderly or our aging population from getting taxed out of their homes. I think it's a great option. And if we, we present something like that in legislation, um, I think it would really help our rural development, our rural areas and the property tax issues that we're seeing now would alleviate some of those because we really do need to protect all you know the property owners in our area. Any additional comments? Here? Yeah, um, a lot of this property tax stuff could have been, or a lot of these taxes uh, could have been solved last uh, legislation, but the Republican Party decided to get up and walk away from it, and, and it's a shame. We shouldn't even be talking about that today. It shouldn't even be a subject. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Mike, any additional comments there? Well, when we look at the taxes and the budgets, both sides have had their fingers in an issue here for a long time. The budgets in the state of Minnesota have been, you know, a billion to two billion dollar surplus every year, no matter who was in charge. So to start pointing fingers, I don't know if that's exactly accurate. It's not really fair. But can we do a better job? And now when we see this nine billion dollar surplus, it raises a lot of eyebrows because people are saying, you know, we are just dying under the weight of these taxes and the state has this much of a surplus, we have an issue. We can deal with that property taxes by lowering, lowering them through that 2% and there's other options as well. Charitable gaming is a uh, charitable tax on gaming, I'm sorry, taxes on charitable gambling is something that we can do as well. We cut those taxes and keep more of that money local so that your nonprofit groups can spend money on playgrounds and things that we need. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question is coming from Chelsea. It will be directed to you, Mike. <clears throat> what should be done with the state's budget surplus that we do currently have? Well, I hit on that a little bit already, and uh, the taxes is definitely an issue. We need to give, it people, give the, tax, the surplus back to the people in the form of tax cuts. You know, Social Security is the prime one, and I think it can be done on, uh, with both sides working together relatively quickly. Um, the income tax, other states are using that and cutting, cutting people's income so that they can keep more money. We need, to, we need to balance our budget so that we're not having this surplus every single year. What we're seeing with the $9 billion surplus is, is, is two-part problem. It's, um, corporate income and one-time one <coughs> spending taxes from money that came through COVID relief and so forth. So once that money is gone and spent, we, we have some issues. You know, we could go very easily go from 
a budget surplus in our state to a deficit. We have the inflation issue is going to infect us, uh, affect us, and uh, we need to look at the future here too because that, that surplus may not be there for very long. Thank you, Greg. Uh, the surplus money, uh, what we should do with that is, is, again, we should tackle the property tax directly with that surplus money. That should be set aside for the people to lower their property taxes and District 5B and the other districts that are going to be affected by this. Uh, another thing that we need to do is, is work on infrastructure in District 5B. I live three miles south of Long Prairie and I still do not have broadband. Um, it's, it's crazy that we do not have it. Todd County is probably one of the worst in, in, in the state that does not have broadband and to attract new businesses, families, um, and if for everybody to prosper, we need the broadband. The kids need it. Um, I cur I, I've seen, witnessed uh, kids doing uh, uh, homework in, in McDonald's parking lot, and it's a shame. You, you, we got to get the broadband there and everything else will follow. We'll be able to be a little bit more prosperous. We're being left behind in, in 5B just for the fact we don't have broadband. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> Any additional comment, Mike? Sure. I don't know if broadband is really the panacea that uh, is brought, brought up here and promoted as, as well as it is. Wadena County is uh, number 13 out of 87 counties that have the most coverage as far as broadband and yet they're still dealing with lack of jobs, lack of uh, high taxes and so forth. So to say that broadband is going to be this great boom for our economy, I, I don't believe it's there. If it is, I mean, if businesses, private businesses want to bring in broadband, that makes sense. But to do it on the taxpayers, no, I don't believe that. Thank you. <clears throat> Any additional comments there? Yes. Um, all of our farmers rely on technology in, in District 5B, from drone technology for soil analysis to everything, and it all requires broadband. And it's only going to get, uh, the technology in farming is only going to increase, and broadband is going to be key to that success for them. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> our next question is coming from Heidi, and it will be directed to you, Greg. Parental control has become a buzzword during this election season. You're both parents. Have you felt like you've had parental rights concerning your kids' education? Um, I, 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 I've always been involved with my kids' educations, and um, I do encourage everybody to show up to the school boards and, and, uh, and, and, and see what's going on there. Um, I think right now we're doing a tremendous job in our school systems for parental rights. Thank you. <clears throat> Mike? Well, our, system, our setup is a little bit different. Uh, we homeschool our kids. Um, so we pretty much do have parental control as much as possible. Um, when my wife first approached me about uh, homeschooling, I wasn't entirely sold on the idea. Um, but with hard work and a little bit of help, it's worked out very well, and it's, it's a good option for our, for our children. They've done very well, graduated, um, went on to college, several of them. So, you know, I look at those options, and there again, when it comes back to the voucher system, I believe that gives parents the options and, and more parental control. If they don't want to send their kids to the public school, but rather send them to a private school or a homeschool option, I believe that that's where that money should be spent, and that would give the parents the parental control that they desire and seek. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Mike, any additional comments there? Um, and again, I'm against the vulture program. The money should stay in the school districts. Thank you. Any additional comments, Mike? No. Nope. Okay. The next question is coming from Dennis, and it'll be directed towards Mike. Well, for these debates, we've asked our viewers to send us questions as well, and we've got a large response this year, and I'm going to mix in one of those. We've been trying to mix them in for most of the debates. Uh, this is just a general philosophy question. What should the role, what should be the role of state government? Well, the role of government, in my mind, and, and actually when you look at our founding fathers and what they presented here was pretty limited. You know, the role was, was taxation, uh, trade, commerce, national defense, and so forth. And, and government has grown and blown up into something way more than it has. And the bureaucracies that are involved in it 
have really limited and probably hurt our country because instead of the state run or the people run legislation, we've actually have bureaucracies running a lot of these, these uh, different forms and functions of government. So I, I'm a firm, believe, firm believer in, in less government. Greg? <clears throat> uh, I agree that we should have a limited government in, in just about every, th every aspects of our lives. Um, you know, from, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, vaccine mandates. I was against that. Um, you know, the government should not have a role in any medical decisions by anybody, men or women. Um, they need to stay out of that completely. You know, to say that, you know, that you want to be, uh, you're for, or you're against government involvement in ma uh, vaccine mandates, but yet you think the government should be involved in the abortion issue, that's kind of hypocritical and I'm not for that at all. Um, and thank you for the question. Mike, any additional comments? Nope. No, nope. any additional comments, Greg? No. Okay, we'll go to our next question. It will be coming from Chelsea and it will be directed to Greg. According to a new MinPost and Bold Research poll, a majority of Minnesotans surveyed say that they support the legalization of marijuana and the legalization of marijuana-derived edibles. What is your position on the legalization of recreational marijuana in Minnesota? I think it should be legal, regulated, and taxed. I think that would be a good source for these local economies to do. I, you know, getting back to an er earlier comment I had made, you know, there are farmers in the area that are shovel ready for this. They're just waiting for a little guidance. Right now it's in the hemp production to do the edibles, and they're all for that. It's, it's, it'd be great for our local economies, and we, if we tax it right, regulate it right, will do it well. It's, it's an estimated uh, billion dollar industry in this state. Um, and I think we should uh, move forward with that right away. Our, our neighboring states have it on their ballot this year, South Dakota, North Dakota does. Um, and we should get it done. Well, you know, we, we don't want to send our people across the border to get to pay the taxes over there. Thank you, Thank Greg. You. Mike? <clears throat> I'm not in favor of legalizing recreational marijuana. Um, when we look at the effects of this, how is it going to benefit our society? I don't believe it will. You know, there's a negative effects that comes to drug use, loss of production, um, mental health issues, and so forth. The argument can be made it's a gateway to harder things. We have enough issues with fentanyl and meth and, and, and other serious drugs where we don't want more legalized or legalizing marijuana just to get more people hooked. I, I don't believe in, in, in legalizing it. Any additional comments there, Greg? Yes, a as a veteran, I know a lot of veterans, um, and they all want it. They need it, they use it as medicine, they don't have access to it because it's a federal offense yet, um, so they can't get it through the VA, so they're buying it on the black market. It's got a lot of med uh, medical properties in that that are beneficial to a lot of the benef uh, veterans, and I'm all for the veterans. Thank you. Any additional comment there, Mike? Well, sure, I think there's two different issues that's being discussed there. Recreational use versus medicinal, and that, that's two totally different subjects. The question was recreational use, and I am not in favor of legalizing drugs for rec recreational use. Thank you. That brings us to our last question before we get into closing comments, and it's coming from Heidi. It'll be directed to you, Mike. <clears throat> uh, tell us what you know, what you think should be happening when it comes to people's health and health insurance in the state of Minnesota. Well, health insurance has been an issue for quite a while now. Going back to the Affordable Care Act, we've seen the costs and the expense to people just skyrocket. You know, so the term Affordable Care Act is kind of comical when you when you look at how the deductibles and how the services have been priced out of so many people's options now. When we when we talk about Greater Minnesota and health care, it's an issue that does need to be looked at, especially we have a lot of seniors, low income, but how do we manage that? There's different options. So much of that is controlled on the federal level that on the state level, I think we'd have a hard time making a lot of those substantive changes. Thank you, Mike. Greg? <clears throat> well, I think, uh, uh, you know, health care should be affordable for everybody. 
period. I mean, there's just no way around it, and we need to increase it. I know that a lot of the farmers that aren't getting the health care they need because of the expense problem, and we need to help them out so they do have affordable health care. Um, they're in a dangerous industry, and, and they need to be protected. Thank you. Additional comments there? No. Mike? Okay, any additional comments? Greg? Okay. We now move to closing arguments, and uh, you each have two minutes, and we'll start with you, Mike. All right. Thank you. Thank you to Lakeland PBS for having us up here. Thanks for the option or the opportunity to speak to the viewers. And, uh, you know, thank you to, to um, Greater Minnesota here for having the option and the, and the possibility of even doing this. You know, I never expected that I would run for office. I never planned on it. I never thought I would. Um, but we live in a great country and a great state where anybody that wants to step up and get involved can do it. You know, so the purpose of the debate tonight is really to inform the, the voters of the differences of myself and my opponent here. You know, I am 100% pro-life, was endorsed by MCCL. My opponent is endorsed by Planned Parenthood. Um, Minnesota Police Officers Association endorsed me as well, knowing that we're gonna support the police officers, where my opponent has been calling for police reform. Uh, the, other, uh, the other thing is the drugs. I, I do not agree with legalizing mar marijuana for recreational use. And, and the difference there is, once again, my opponent is endorsed by you know, a campaign for legalizing that. And also with the Second Amendment, that, that's something I'm very firm on. I don't believe that we need more, more uh, attacks on our Second Amendment. And yet, you know, the gun control has come up and the red flag laws, which my opponent is supportive. So thank you very much to all the voters in District 5B. Thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight. And uh, God willing, you know, I'll be the next representative for our area. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Great. Hi, and uh, you know, as a, as a swing voter getting down to St. Paul, um, you know, I will be getting stuff done for District 5B that hasn't been accomplished ever and we've been voting in the Republican Party in that district and they haven't done anything so a good way to look at the future is look at the past I'm sure if my opponent gets elected we'll get exactly that nothing from him a um, hundred years ago uh, my great-grandfather great-great-grandfather was a representative in Minnesota um, and, and he was voted in and that was a bipartisan position back then and they actually got things done for their districts back then because there wasn't the party politics. Um, I will never vote for party politics because I'm not going to be voting down here as a party uh, for, for the Republicans or the Democrats. And, you know, and I will vote only for the District 5B. Now, my opponent here may, uh, mentioned a couple of three things here that were false. Um, and I'm, just, I'm not even going to elaborate on which three they were. But there, he was talking about me and how I, my stance are. Um, and they're false, period. So he can, he can go ahead and do that for whatever he wants, but um, it's not going to get him anywhere. Um, but I do want to close with thanking uh, PBS for having us here. It was a great forum. I'm happy to be here, um, and I wish you'd do more of those. And, and I'm glad my opponent showed up for this one. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Sorry I got off to a rough start with you. <laughs> On behalf of the board and the staff at Lakeland Public Television, we thank you both for taking time out of your evening to share your views on uh, your politics, and good luck to both of you in the campaign this fall. Thank you. If you uh, missed any portion of tonight's debate and you'd like to get it later, you can watch it on Lakeland Public Television, our website, and it'll be posted in about 24 hours. Also, the Brainerd Dispatch provides an additional candidate coverage in general at their special election website, BrainerdDispatch.com slash vote. You can also find election coverage on KAAXE or KAXE on their website at KAXE.org. Tomorrow night, tune in. We have one more debate at 8 o'clock, and that will be uh, House uh, 6B uh, Representatives John Heinzman and Sally Boos. Again, that'll be 8 o'clock tomorrow night, and see you then. Thank you.
Lakeland News is member-supported content. Please consider supporting Lakeland News today.